Hello and welcome to the Career Success Podcast. I'm Jason Connolly. If you're a regular listener, it's great to have you back. But if you're new, welcome to the show. In this series every week, we speak to the biggest names in business all across the globe. We talk about their career stories, the lessons learned, how they overcome challenges and what success habits they practice. This is practical advice to help you in your career. If you have a passion for business, then this is the podcast for you. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Katerina Costula from London. Katerina coaches leaders for impact and fulfillment as the founder of a coaching company, The Leader Path. Before that, she was a business leader at Google. Her best-selling book, Hold Successful Meetings, is part of the Penguin Expert series. She is also a Forbes Coaches Council and coaches for Inset Business School. Katerina, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, me too. So before we kind of get started about sort of the current day, the book that you've got, tell us about you and kind of give us a whistle-stop tour of your career. Sure. I'm from Greece originally. I started marketing. I was from a small town in Greece and I always dreamt of traveling the world and uh, getting outside of Greece. So that's what I did after I finished university. I moved to Spain and joined an advertising agency. And then three years later, I moved to, to France to do my MBA, France and Singapore. And then I wanted to move to, to the UK. And, but it was a bad year. It was 2009. There was this crisis. I finished my MBA. I didn't have any job offers. It was really hard to move into a country you've never worked before. And I, I, I took a step back. I said, okay, I want to move to the UK. What is it that I really want to do? I was applying nonstop without having any focus. And then I took a step back and said, what would I really like to do? And what came up was I would like to work for Google. So I went into the YouTube channel to see the Google offices in London and started visualizing myself there. And one of these tens, tens of applications was at Google. So I, it happened that once I got clear that this is what I wanted, like almost magically, a recruiter from Google gave me the phone call. I, I don't know whether people believe this, but this is what happened. And I stopped applying to anything else. I was like, this is it. I'm getting this job. Uh, and, and you can imagine I, I was um, jobless and broke because I had given all my savings to this MBA. And I moved to the UK with this one suitcase. And I, I still insist in not applying to anything else. Like I put all, this, all my eggs on this basket. I was going to get that Google job. So I went into those interviews, moving, moved in the UK. And I got the job. <laughs> What, what, what was it about Google that was kind of appealing to you? What was what was it about the company that made you think, I want to put all my eggs into this basket? And it wasn't, it's funny, because when they had come into the campus to present, I wasn't that impressed, mm. because the presentation was, you need to be techie, you need to love tech, and I wasn't one of those people. Uh, but then the, I wanted to go into media, right? but, the, and the, but the more I was reading about it, I was really fascinated by their culture, the, the culture of innovation and fast moving, the, the people they were hiring. And I started seeing that this is where the media was going. Like they had start, just had acquired YouTube, like the, the new media. And I think that's why I wanted to work there, the culture. And, and it was back then, let's be honest, it was voted the best employer in the world. <laughs> so it was an easy sell. Uh -huh. I was like, let's be ambitious here uh, back then. And, and for many years in a row, they were voted the best employer in the world. They, they treat their employees very well. And I, I'm sure this had a part in my desire to join that organization. And it, it kind of resonates with me. I remember I put all my eggs when I was really young in the Virgin Atlantic basket when I was uh, 18 years old. And Oh, I remember turning up for that job interview at least two hours early, walking around, 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 <laughs> waiting for that interview to start. So I can, I can relate to you there. When you uh, kind of went for the role then, how, how did you kind of prepare yourself for that interview and, and, and made sure that you got it, even though kind of you had some of these preconceptions in your mind about Google from your experiences of them turning up on the campus? Yes, I, I started reading. I was reading articles. Yeah. I, I remember because the role was to manage agency rela relationships. I, I pulled in favors to interview agency CEOs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like I, I remember I had a classmate that her mother was an agency CEO and I interviewed her to really understand the client. So when I, I, I went in really prepared, but I, I, I think a big part of the success was I worked really on my mindset. Mm. 
I said, I had read about visualization and, and I knew how I felt and how I approached and my energy during those interviews would, would be very important. And funny enough, when I got the role, the director said, everybody else was treating me like I was a bear because it was 2009, a recession. It was, again, Google was receiving 2 million CVs a year. It is a very competitive. Wow. So people were going in intimidated. intimidated. I went, I, my mindset was, I'm not going in a job interview. I'm going to meet my new colleagues and see my new office. That's what I told myself. And that was my attitude. I was very relaxed uh, meeting my new colleagues. So I was a lot more friendly and warm. And, and this is what made the difference. It wasn't my astonishing bio. Like I was in a small advertising mm. agency in Spain before. I was in Greece. Like I didn't have uh, the huge credentials. It was the preparation and the mindset and what was it that so you kind of went in there and, and what was it that they kind of saw in you do you think at that at that point and how, how old was you at that time i was 27 right okay what was it that you think google saw in you that made you successful in that process because obviously it's as you've rightly said it's it's highly competitive yes so I did have a good M MBA. I don't want to say credentials are not important. I had just finished wow. my INSEAD MBA and I did, I performed, they had a case study, but even that, I remember in the first interview, I made a mistake. I, I wasn't aware of, they asked me something about quality score in search rankings. And I, I made it, I made a mistake. And that's what I tell now my clients. It's not about getting it perfect. Like I, I, I remember pretty clearly that I got something around their product wrong. What, I, what they saw in me, I think it was this hunger, it was this preparation, like the, the fact that at some point I gave an insight about the industry, which I had learned through my extensive reading. And I wouldn't have been able to do this extensive reading if I had kept applying to other companies. So I guess it was this hunger, enthusiasm, and being relaxed, really confident. I was exuding confidence. I, I worked really hard on believing that this was my job. How did you get that confidence? Where did that confidence come from? That confidence came when I was in Greece and applying to tens of companies for months and I, I wasn't hearing back. I was starting getting really depressed. And then someone gave me a book, which is very frowned upon. But the book that they gave me was The Secret. I don't know if you've heard about it. Oh, Rhonda de Berg. Yes, I remember reading that uh, book in New York. And I still to this day have mixed views on it but I totally 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 agree with the underlying message that positive attracts positive and I do believe in the law of attraction so yeah I, I, I read that book at a very young age and it, it, it still has an impact on me today. Yes so again myself looking back I have, I'm the same as you I, there, I don't agree with everything in the book but at that point it was exactly what I needed because the message was you need to behave like what you want, you have it already. Mm. And I, I totally bought into that. So I, I, I was confident and happy because I convinced myself this was my job. It was, I was getting it. And I managed to do it for the one month the recruitment process was going on. I totally bought, mm. bought into this concept and it really helped me land that job. Well, I believe that you need to be what you want to become. And if you be that person or you want to be a manager and you, you want to become that, you need to start exuding those, those kind of qualities to be seen in that role or to, to get that promotion. What's it actually like to work at Google? Because I, I've never spoken to anyone who works at Google and I think we, we all kind of are familiar with what kind of the, the PR Google puts out there about what it's like to actually work there. But from working there as the inside, you know, from being there in the inside, being a leader, what, what, what's it actually like? I stayed for eight years. So there was a lot of ups and downs. I have to say it, it has a good, the culture of people helping each other was one of the things I valued the most. I, I enjoyed really the role. I joined the global agency team. So I was traveling the world, meeting my, my global agency clients. It was, I, I, I was really enjoying it. Like for a few years, I, I was living the dream, right? Mm. But then as many big companies, as the years went on, four years I was in the role, I had my, I, I had my first child, I had my first maternity leave, and that's when I did a coaching training and I fell in love with coaching. So I, I guess halfway through, I, I, I started, I fell in love with a different field 
so I was a little bit um, conflicted. I started coaching internally, but I was still keeping my clients. And then I started seeing the the negatives of being such a big company uh internal meetings <laughs> that's uh, uh mm-hmm. i will be talking later what that was one of the things i found insufferable uh being why did you find that insufferable what was it was it just the meetings lacked purpose or was it they just seemed irrelevant or were they too long what, what was it about the meetings that started to make you get into that mindset and it, it's funny because when larry page the google ceo became a ceo the first email he ever sent the organization was not about strategy. It was not about the future. It was about meetings. Like he said, he was very passionate about, we only have meetings to make decisions, no more than 10 people in meetings. So I know that the CEO of the company really tried to create a healthy meeting culture, but maybe because I was in a global role and we had a lot of coordination meetings. And because we were a geographically dispersed team, so all these internal meetings were virtual back then, there were a lot of updates which I found very boring and they are, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, so usually uh, meetings to have updates are really boring. Like if it's a meeting about just solving a problem or making a decision, you're engaged. It's not that boring. And I guess because I was in sales, right. I, my meetings with my clients were so interesting because they were high stakes. M- millions were on the line, big projects. So there was a big contrast for me, the, the meetings I had with my clients, which I really enjoyed and then going back to internal meetings, which were updates from different countries, for example. But that was because you were driving the external meetings and you were the kind of creator of them. Is that the case? Yes. And what you said is actually confirmed by, by research that when you're the leader of the meeting, you think the meeting is better than, what the, than when no. you're a participant in the meeting. So probably there was this type of bias too. Okay. And I, I guess th- this leads really nicely on to your book. How did you, so you decided that you wanted to leave Google. You found this passion for coaching. How, how did it, it must have been quite scary at the time to even contemplate leaving a giant like Google. And I, I'm guessing at the time you left, we were kind of well out of the recession. But even so, that must have been a big leap for you. It, it was scary. It was a decision that took me years. Jason, like it was a Mm. very slow process. And that's what I tell my clients as well. Sometimes you you will need a lot of time to make a transition like this. And not because initially I was interested in coaching and you need to build from an interest to build competence. I I completed a master's of science in coaching. I, I started doing my hours and my accreditations and then you build competence and then you build confidence about the new passion, right? So it's not an easy process to change careers halfway through your career to totally no. change what you, what you do and the the way it went is I, I was still at google but i started blogging about personal development and the blogging took off and i was also since the beginning i was pretty honest with google i'm a business leader at google and a coach i was open on, about it on my linkedin on my articles i was signing with the both the titles and at some point people I was doing a lot of pro bono coaching. People started reaching out that have read the articles and they're saying, okay, we want to pay you for coaching. I was like, okay, then. And then I set up a a company. (laughs) And and then even then I thought, okay, I will build that on the side. Again, transparent. Coaching is one of the few things Google allows you to do on the side. And I thought I I will stay with Google longer until I build that on the side. And then it wasn't working, Jason. Like it's, I don't know if you've ever tried it to be, have a corporate role. I was a, I have two kids by that time. I was completing a master's in coaching and I had an external coaching practice. It it just wasn't working. So. A sort of job overload. And this happened, I, in my second maternity leave, I, I took a sabbatical. We went with the family in Thailand for six months in a tropical island and I think also that stepping off the ladder helped me realize actually that's the wrong ladder for me I think sometimes that I shouldn't be climbing that ladder that I want to do something else like taking those six months off and moving outside of the UK to a tropical island really helped me realize what I really wanted to do so by the time why I'm saying all this by the time I submitted my resignation and I sent my goodbye email to Google and it was emotional it was eight years We talked about how much I loved the company, how much my identity was defined by the company. But the moment I was leaving, I didn't see it as a risk. 
uh, I remember a, a colleague, a colleague hmm. sent me a message said, oh, you're making that leap or you're taking that risk. And for a few seconds, I was like, what's he talking about? Because it, it, I had worked on that process so long. And I guess it was a similar, I, I, of course, my side hustle, I had three clients. There was nowhere, my, my income was nowhere near <laughs> what I was making at Google, but I, it was the same, like eight years ago, I had this faith and belief this is going to work out. I don't know how, but I know it's going to work out. And I guess you obviously, you left, you, you built up the, the consultancy business. And I guess kind of what we've talked about so far is leads really nicely onto the book, the book titled Hold Successful Meetings by uh, Penguin Business Experts. Now, why there was obviously a real passion within you to write a book about such a topic. Well, what made you decide to write this book about meetings? What, where was this kind of passion within? It must have been more than just you kind of being at meetings within Google and feeling some level of frustration. You know what? I, I felt frustration. I remember at some point I was thinking, I would I told my friend, I didn't write that in the book, so that's between you and me, Jason, but I remember telling a friend when I was still at Google, I would have stayed longer if it weren't for the internal meeting. It, I, it was something, I don't know, as a personality, I was really feeling trapped and probably a part of me because I wanted to leave the company. But this meeting, it was a pain point for me. And then it, it started being a pain point for my clients. I was coaching clients and they were always bring up those meetings. And... I was, it wasn't my idea to write a book about meetings, Jason. It was actually Penguin that suggested it. And my initial, I was like, what? Meetings? I hate meetings. And then I realized, like, they sent me this email because they had found my writing online and they said, we want you to contribute a book for the series. And these are the topics we're thinking about. And I went for a walk thinking about this topic. And I said, I thought I hated meetings. My clients suffer from meetings. But then I realized all my career my key product, my key craft, whether I was a salesperson at Google or a coach, I was being paid to have successful meetings. A coaching session is a meeting, a sales um, session is also a meeting. So I had invested so much learning and practice. And so I had all this knowledge. And, and once I made that link, actually I am an expert in meetings. It just, how can I bring all my learnings from team coaching and coaching and sales and give those tools to business leaders that are leading any kind of meeting that could be a really good book and it will solve a real problem so that was my thinking and that's how the book came about and what a compliment to be reached out to by penguin to you must have been making some impacts online for your blogs to be kind of picked up and it kind of obviously the title it, it speaks for itself hold successful meetings but tell me obviously we're not going to unpack the whole book during this episode or even come close to it but Kind of what, what's key to you about a successful meeting? What, you know, what is the kind of pillar of ensuring that it is a successful meeting? The book is organized in three pillars. The first is purpose, then people, and then process. So I would say the first thing is that the meeting has a clear purpose. And I have a framework of making that simple, how to know what the purpose of the meeting is. And we, we can discuss that if that's of interest. Then it's the people, because even if you have a great purpose, if the people... Uh, if you don't have an inclusive environment, if you have, don't have psychological safety, if the people cannot bring their best ideas and their best self in the meeting, then your meeting will not be successful. And then the, the third pillar of the book is around process, which also you need some process to have fewer meetings. For example, I have a full chapter how you can have fewer meetings uh, and, and process that will set you up for success, how to begin a meeting, how to end a meeting, what to do when the meeting is virtual. So this is how I approach the topic. It's the purpose people process. I guess kind of with the book, with people who read it and kind of go, go through this process, do you, do you find that people who've kind of read it, it, you need to go through this structure every time to ensure that it is a good meeting or is the book kind of educating you how to get the best or, you know, what, what, what's kind of the, the reception and the end goal for people who have read it? So the book is really fresh. I don't, mm. I don't think we've even, it's not even a month old when it launched. It, it launched, it, had, it was a very warm welcome. Like it, it reached number one in, in this category in France, Germany, Netherlands, mm. uh, very well in the UK and the US. So, and I, I just now started, I, I was waiting. Oh, I launched the book and I was waiting for the next day for people to the emails to, to, to start coming. It took a little bit longer than that. I was still waiting. Let's see, how did people receive that? Because I had I had better readers before, but it's different, yeah. right? Yeah. 
And I realized, and I was a little bit worried, Jason, to tell you the truth, not about, I, I knew the book, I, I believe in the frameworks. I was worried that we think meetings are boring. I thought meetings are boring. And I was worried about the title. I was thinking, oh, because for me, meetings, I use meetings as a lens to everything, like how you make decisions with your team, how you ideate with your team, how you inspire action. Like I use meetings as a lens to how you lead. So it was a very rich and substantial book for me, but I was wondering, would people read the title meetings and maybe they think it's a boring book around agendas and, and won't buy it? And, and this has not been the case. Like I, I'm receiving emails, oh, I was in a very ineffective meeting. I thought of you, I'm reading the book. The, the, re the reception has been really warm. That's lovely to hear. And since, since kind of launching the book, obviously you've had a lot of feedback from people um, and, and it's, it's really lovely to hear about all the feedback we've been getting. But what, what do you kind of think have been the most common mistakes people tend to make in meetings before kind of, you know, c coming across your learnings and, uh, and the book? So I observe a lot of meetings as part of my coaching practice. And I also observed a lot of meetings as part of the research of the book. And I'll give you an example. I, I was observing the meeting of a marketing team. They want to launch a webinar for their clients. And the leader goes and says, okay, option A or option B, how, which system are you going to use for the webinar? And then another participant jumps and said, oh, how about option C? A third participant says, I don't know what we're discussing this. Let's do what we always did. The leader wants to make a decision, says, okay, we're going with option A. Is everybody okay with that? And then the creative participant says, how about option D? And then they start discussing and no decision has been made, right? What happened there? And, and this is a meeting I observed. I was like, why did these people, they are smart individuals, why did the meeting was so chaotic? And I researched this. And the reason is because individually, we don't solve problems linearly. Like there's four steps to solving a problem is defining the problem, develop the ideas, decide and do what you decided. It's my 4D meeting framework. So to solve any problem, these are the stages. But as individuals, you jump around the stages, Imagine you bring people in this meeting and everyone is on their own stage as it happened in this one. Like someone was litigating, someone did not see the problem. The leader was trying to make a decision and it's chaos. They cannot organize themselves. So that's why I said the first thing is to say, which one of the four Ds are we working on right now? And it could be one meeting. It could be an ideation meeting. So it will be a develop ideas and you just go with ideas. It could be a decision meeting. Or if you want to go through more than one stage, you do it in distinct sections, oh. uh, right? You say, we define the problem now. Now we idea develop ideas. We're not making a decision. So you actually organize the participants to work towards the same outcome at the same time. That's a skill set in itself. You think so? Because I, I thought it can be really like, it's only four Ds. It, I think it's the first book in, in its category because all the, the other books I was reading, they were like saying there are 16 categories of meetings. For me, it was very important to make it simple for people. It's just four, four Ds. You either define a problem or a goal, you develop ideas, you make it, you decide, or you want someone to do something, whether in the meeting or afterwards. But I guess so many people overcomplicate uh, me. And through your simplification, it, it, it sounds easy. But I guess for a lot of people, when they first read the book, when they're not used to that way of kind of thinking, that way of acting, it even may, may be too simplified. And I, I guess it's kind of, you know, showing people that actually... You know, you can hold a successful meeting and this is, you know, kind of how you do it. But I, I guess one kind of other question is, how did you, is this all kind of your own thought process that's in this book? Obviously, you've done research. Did you take a lot of learnings from other places, uh, from other kind of things that you'd read? Or what, what was the kind of inspiration? Was it from different places? You picked different points that you learned? Or was it kind of, you, you know, a lot of your mindset and, and your experiences in general? I did extensive research. So I read, obviously, everything, all the books on the topic when I was building the proposal. But then after I created the framework, and, and this was inspired, I, I read, it was Al um, Petrileri, I think, it was his article in HBR that was saying about how we think, li we don't think li solve problems linearly. And that was the, the aha moment for me to develop the 4D meeting framework. So obviously no idea, like we stand in shoulders of, of giants, but once I developed the framework, then it was easier to do the research. It was okay, develop ideas. 
how do we best develop ideas, making decisions, how read all the research around this. So the, the book is heavily researched. It has like a lot of pages of references. I also interviewed people. I interviewed um, team coaches, famous team coaches. Uh, I interview virtual facilitators. I interview people running design sprints. And then I recruited people to, to teams to experiment, observe their meetings, test those ideas. So this was my, my process. Kind of coming to current day, obviously, the, the world is a, a very different place at the moment. Most meetings are happening online. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the hybrid model and, you know, will, will workplaces ever be the same? Do, do you think it's possible to hold sort of the same meaningful and successful meetings online that you can have in person? Or do you think something's lost by having meetings over uh, the Internet? I think you can. And that's supported by research. Like, the, for example, for years, we had a lot of data for therapy, online therapy and in-person therapy. And it was the same or for meetings. But you need to be aware of the opportunities and challenges. Opportunities is obviously you can have the right attendees. You don't have all this expense and time getting the right people in the room, right? There's, this is a huge opportunity of virtual meetings. There is the challenges. Uh, there are more interruptions. It's harder to have participation. The eye contact is more difficult because you need to look at the camera, but you need to get feedback looking at the people in their face. And or if you have mm. sound sound issues, you may come across as untrustworthy subconsciously. When someone we cannot understand what someone is saying, probably for from bad internet, we may think they're untrustworthy. So there are many challenges and many opportunities of virtual meetings. We just need to learn to manage them effectively to make the most of the opportunities and, and deal with the challenges. What's kind of your top tip then for, uh, you know, if you're a facilitator of a meeting, it's online, it, it's still alien to a lot of us. And I totally relate to what you're saying. I, I find myself in a lot of Zoom meetings and I kind of often think to myself, oh, I see myself looking at the screen. I'm not looking at the camera. Oh, I should be looking at the camera. Now I'm looking at the screen. There's a lot going on and there's a lot to process. Well, what's kind of your top tip for, uh, I suppose it's very relevant to current day, your, your top tip for holding a successful online meeting? First of all, to, to say that most of the practices are the same, like having a clear purpose, creating a psychologically safe environment. These are the most important things for successful meetings, whether they're virtual or in person. That said, if we're talking about how to manage the process, I would say spend some time on breakouts and connecting because you're missing the all this banter of sitting on the meeting or the breaks, mm. etc. If you don't consciously recreate this, uh, it will be lost and you will be worse for it. That's one of my tips. And then you will need more structure in a virtual meeting to make sure people participate because it's really harder. There's more interruptions and it's harder for people to participate. So I will be, I will need more, like by structure, I mean, even as simple as a round robin, let's hear from everyone. Something like this can make it easier for people to, to participate. And I think that's a really good point as well. I think when you're in, I know I've found this myself with Zoom meetings. When you're in one, you can find that you get straight on to business and you miss those kind of uh, little social interactions, which actually kind of bond people, you know, during any kind of social interaction. So obviously the book's been really well received. What, what's kind of next for you, Katerina? So I, I also created a, an online course about mm. this topic because I, I, I predicted that people, and I, it started happening, they say, oh, we have a meetings issue. Can you come and speak? And I wanted to have a well-produced resource for people. Mm -hmm. But then I'm already thinking about my next book. I, I also, my next book plus group coaching program, which is around defining your three-year vision. So that's my next project. I'm in research phase now. I'm reading, like I have 15 books I need to read on the topic. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I already launched a group coaching program in January around defining your three-year vision because I always, I like doing many things. I knew I was preparing for the launch of the meetings book because I work on clarity and leadership. So meetings were around leadership. Clarity is my other pillar of my work. So I'm relaunching the group coaching program in October and I'm writing, uh, I, I will... I, I'm hoping now it's the research in September to put a proposal together for the new book around defining your three-year vision. And that's a really interesting topic, being a recruiter myself. I, I always talk to people about the five and 10-year plan, but I, I, I can't kind of emphasize enough 
how valuable it is to kind of have a plan. A lot, a lot of people find themselves that they have a kind of idea of where they want to be, but without an actual plan and kind of the steps in, in place, you know, how likely are you to get there without a plan in place and kind of milestones that you need to reach. You have a quiz uh, for people to find out how successful are your meetings. Yes, indeed. So you can find the quiz. It's at my w- website, theleaderpath.com slash quiz, or even in the homepage, you can find it, theleaderpath.com. And yeah, because as I, as I said, we tend to overestimate how good are the meetings we run. <laughs> well, it's a great thing that there's a quiz uh, available and people can actually go on there and uh, find out how successful they are. Katrina, it's been such a nice time talking to you. I think you've raised so many great points and I think book sounds like a valuable resource uh, for anybody out there who's a business leader and wanting to get the best out of their team. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Well, that was uh, Katerina Pistula from London uh, talking about hold successful meetings. I'm Jason Connolly. This is the Career Success Podcast. Until next time, goodbye.